Uh, I'm part of the Vision and Image Processing Research Group. We're uh, situated in Systems Design Engineering. Our mandate it covers two aspects. One, conduct high caliber research in computer vision, image processing, pattern recognition, those types of aspects. Our other mandate is to train, educate, and provide an enhanced academic experience for highly qualified people. This stretches um, postdoctoral fellows, undergraduate students, as well as graduate students as well. So we're trying to do uh, research and training all at the same time. As a group, we have a very broad interest in different applications and different methodologies. I put together a list of our what I call the membership of the VIP group. And I was kind of surprised at how, how long the, the list actually became. We have four people who share lab space. So VIP is really a lab that we share space in, but I think the way I'd really like to look at it is we, we don't have any borders. We kind of open up the door and interact with people as well as we can across campus and outside of campus. So VIP in itself is just a room where we grad students and postdoctoral fellows get to work, but I look at it as more of an uh, enhanced experience. So myself, uh, Paul Figa, Ed Jernigan, Hamid Tazush have shared space. We have what I call active participants, people who come out to our meetings, actively co-supervise graduate students, Ed Versquet, uh, John Zellick, Jeff Orchard, Richard Mann. Uh, most of those people are here today. Uh, connections on campus, we work with civil engineering actively, optometry, physics, geography, I put dot, 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 just in case I miss somebody. Uh, we have national connections in other imaging labs through York, uh, UBC, McGill, Toronto, again, la, la, la. International connections, MIT, Brazil, Uruguay, Oxford, we have connections worldwide. We have numerous industry connections where we go and find applications, Imedis, Delsa, Neptech, MDA, and, and, uh, and the list goes on. So we're a very active group, we're not a very large group uh, per se with respect to the lab, but we're a very active group in terms of all the spin-offs and the people that we relate to. What do we do? Well, we're here at an Im imaging conference. Uh, uh, Otman Vizier commented that we focus on remote sensing. I don't think that's the case. We do remote sensing work, but we do a whole bunch of other things as well biomedical imaging, hierarchical statistics, wavelets, human vision systems modeling, nonlinear image processing, object tracking, cognitive systems, and intelligent HMIs. What I'd like to do is just go in some of these application areas and, and um, show you a little bit more. We're also into fundamentals. We're not just looking for an application and trying to build up the application. We have a strong mathematical understanding of images and something that we promote. So finding the application is really cool at the end of the day, and that's why we interact a lot outside of the group, but we're really interested in sound models to, to, to drive those processes. So for, as an example of some of these questions or, or relationships that we create, are there mathematical models for wavelet statistics? Everyone's familiar with wavelets and how to break down a signal, but how can we relate the wavelet coefficients that are being popped out? What mathematical relationships exist between fine and coarse scales? And this is something that comes up all the time in remote sensing and medical imaging as well. How can we relate those scales? How can one create pyramids from irregularly shaped image objects? So if you're running some kind of a segmentation procedure and all of a sudden your grids aren't raster based any longer and you have to look at the different objects, how can you create models to, to make those things work? And also how can the interrelationship of the models of the scene be generated? So you get to a point of image understanding and we have objects with respect to each other and the human can interpret this readily, but we have a heck of a time teaching the computer to do the same kinds of things. So we need models to do that. What I'd like to do is stem from some of these concepts and uh, show some more specific applications. This is my, my personal key project area. And I checked my calendar last night. It was kind of strange because today, as of today, 10 years ago today, I was defending my PhD thesis here at the University of Waterloo. I find that hard to believe because it seems like only yesterday I don't seem to have aged a single day during that time, but here I am. Uh, I defended this. I'm still working on it. It's, it's um, a kind of problem that you look at, and it's going to be very difficult to solve, and that's why I've made a career interest in doing it. It's the operational classification of satellite CIS imagery. The purposes are for navigation, let ships navigate. Let, um, uh, do, for environmental purposes, how do we know the Earth is warming up? Well, we calculate ice volumes. Why is it difficult? The data is nasty. It's nonlinear. It's noisy. It's non-stationary. It's the messiest stuff you could think of. It's messier, in my experience, than what I found in, in medical imaging. 
I use advanced mathematical models, Markov random field models, to help drive this process. And similar to, to um, uh, uh, what was discussed a little bit earlier today, is there's ICE analysts whose full-time job is to analyze this data very much like radiologists. So when I started my PhD, I had this idea of replacing the ICE analysts, trained professionals, just like the idea of replacing the radiologists. It, it's the same kind of theme. And uh, since that time, I realized you can't replace radiologists, and you can't replace the ice analyst as well. So we need to find other ways to work with them. And here's an example of that. So in the bottom left here, it doesn't show up very well, but this is a product that the ice analyst would actually create. The ice analyst would circle big regions, identify ice types in those regions. We've overlaid those regions here. And here's a product that we produce that's pixel-based. So we don't look at regions anymore, because that's all the ice analyst has time for. We break it down pixel by pixel, and that's where a true computer vision solution comes in handy, because there's no um, other methods in order to, do, to solve this. The, the human can't solve that particular problem. <coughs> Multi-scale statistics, Paul Figa's type of work, um, affects remote sensing as well, biomedical. Here's a remote sensing example. So we have data at coarse scales. We have data at fine scales. How do you interact that data together in order to produce the final product? Here's an example of unwrapping interferometric radar-based data. So it's phase data. It's based on a uh, topographical map. So the phase information is here. The coherence, co coherency data is here. We produce a topographical map like this. We smooth it out a little bit, and we get a final product. So this produces a top topographical map. Working with cells, here's building image models of cells. So we there's certain assumptions you can make about these cells that really don't show up very well. And from that, you can go ahead and identify what are cells and what are not cells. They need a mathematical model of what the cells look like in order to make those final conclusions. <coughs> John Zellick <coughs> is interested in intelligent, uh, runs a, a separate lab, the Intelligent Human Interface. He's interested in sensory substitution. So. People who are, have difficulty seeing, you can create a camera that provides tactile feedback in terms of a, a haptic glove. And also, if you're looking at robotic surgery, using the same kind of techniques over the internet even. Here's an example of such a glove that John built. So there's a vision system that provides tactile information to the hand and helps blind people navigate. Object tracking is a really big topic right now. Ever since 9-11, people are concerned about security. So tracking people, not just taking videos of them, but actually interpreting that data, is a very important part of, of uh, uh, imaging applications in this day. One of the focuses that we've looked at is vehicle tracking. So there's consultants out there who like to track, count vehicles through an intersection. They like to know the type of vehicle, where they're going, time of day, all that kind of information, be able to put it together. So right now what they do is they videotape, bring it back to the lab, play the VHS tape back, and have someone in front of the screen doing it manually. It's obvious for us that we could replace that with a human operator. This uh, research has been spun off into a company called Myovision, and they're in the accelerator center right now. Limb tracking, so humans. Let's, I've been told this might not work, so we'll find out. Ah, so tracking of, no, we're going to get some help here. Play it again. So tracking of limbs, and you're going to put the limb behind the body and bring the limb back out and continues tracking it. Again, something a human takes for granted, but in computer vision system, this is very, very difficult to monitor. Another um, application area is something called SLAM. So trying to teach a robot how to understand its environment and then navigate it through it without any a priori information. So we use vision systems to look, capture features, inter uh, determine depth cues, and then navigate through an environment remember the environment, and be able to navigate back through it as well. So as the robot moves, it can collect three-dimensional information, and that's part of this SLAM process. Again, very um, popular in terms of research efforts, but highly unsolved. 
very difficult problem, something we take for granted, but very difficult to teach the computer how to do. So that's just an overview of the, the vision and image processing lab. I'd be happy to answer any questions. David, the one obvious question is then that, uh, your perception of the relationship between the different kinds of work the group, uh, groups do. Well, I'm, I'm honestly not familiar with Miami. I am uh, familiar with PAMI because it was once housed in systems design. And I think it's very synergetic. I think there's, if you looked at the two presentations, there's a, there's a lot of differences. There's a lot of opportunity to do research in the imaging fields. And I see a shared experience. Um, sometimes when I run the VIP research presentations and we have an external speaker coming on campus that could be interested to PAMI, there's an invitation sent out to PAMI. So I see this already working on an informal basis and um, similar methodologies, different application areas, and, and that's a really positive thing on campus. Excellent. Questions, comments uh, from anybody? Go ahead. Um, you mentioned both uh, API and uh, web tracking. Mm -hmm. What types of eye tracking is like that? That's been done in the past. Ed Jernigan used to have some of his research in that particular field. Um, I can't think of anyone, any graduate students actively doing that right now. So historically, we have. Other questions or comments here? Yep. The remote sensing. You say you haven't been able to replace the person. The ice analyst? Yeah. And where, where does that come in between the remote sensing and the picture mm. given that? The SAR data is captured. It's downloaded to a site in Gatineau, Quebec. That data is sent to the Canadian Ice Service located in Ottawa, where there's full time ice analysts who process the data on a, on a, on a, on a very scheduled basis. They produce a, a detailed ice map. That ice map is sent to the ships or put into storage. What cannot be done is sending this, the remote sensing data is copyright. So they cannot send that to the ships. Interpreted products can be sent to the ships. That's why the need for the ice analysts. Interesting. Other comments? Unless, unless the ships want to pay $5,000 a scene for that data. Are you hey, comments. Uh, thank you very much, David. Thanks.